OK. So we're working here on coming up with a, um, an iterated um, inverse to the uh, least squares problem. And I showed you at the very end yesterday how we can have this damped least squares uh, solution, um, where uh, if we take uh, L transpose L, we make sure that it's uh, non-singular along the diagonal by adding um, some uh, a, a uh, an identity matrix that's uh, of course the same size as L transpose L, so it would be the number of blocks by the number of blocks, and that's um, um, scaled, the ones along the diagonal of the identity matrix are scaled by this lambda. So that lambda is the adjustable damping factor. And uh, you know, typically, you'd want to choose it to be just large enough that you can get convergence without having the singular values uh, run away. Um, but um, uh, and and uh, you know, destroy the inversion. Uh, but you can also choose lambda to be quite large, all right. And um, that's a strategy that uh, Clairbout advocates actually in um, PVI, his PVI book. And what you get then is you have a uh, uh, and and lambda has units of uh, uh, seconds squared because it's. Uh, it's chosen to be the, uh, you know, it's in the same units as L transpose L. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's meters squared. Okay, so um, uh, if it's very large, it looks like this very simple back projection here, where you take your data travel times, which are in seconds, and you you multiply them by L transpose. So uh, you know that's just the the matrix, uh, the non-square matrix of the lengths um, of each ray and each block, and so that does that summation that was, uh, you know, in the last uh, uh, the the summation in the last uh, uh, number eleven um, notes um, that is doing most of the work. Of the uh, of the back projection, okay, especially under the tomographic approximation, where only the uh, the diagonals of L transpose L matter, and that's kind of what we're doing here. You know, if we set lambda to be very large, you know, and that's going to make the diagonal of L transpose L plus lambda i, that's going to make the diagonal of that matrix much much larger than anything off diagonal, and so it effectively sets the um, the off-diagonal elements to zero with very little influence. So now you can see in the context, you know, mathematically of a least squares inverse to this problem, um, what the tomographic approximation means. It means essentially a very highly overdamped solution where the scaling <coughs> basically is uh, the same for every uh, uh, for every element for every Every element of the model space, every entry along this column vector of the um, of the slowness perturbations delta s. So, you know this little um, um, <clears throat> this little summation here is really that it's uh, uh, it's most of the work, okay, and everything else is just sort of refining the scaling of one block against another. <clears throat> now uh, to solve this uh, uh, to solve this properly, all right, we uh, you know we have to take this damped uh, this damp solution and we have to uh, do something like singular value decomposition, okay. <clears throat> so uh, uh, we come up with the. Uh, um, the row and column uh, eigenvectors uh, u and v matrices, and uh, we also have a uh, uh, diagonal matrix which is the eigenvalues, and all of that is partitioned to leave out the 
zero or maybe the near zero eigenvalues. Okay, so that's what little p's underneath uh, as subscripts mean. Those are partition matrices to to remove the uh, the eigenvectors and eigen uh, the eigenvectors that belong to all the zero eigenvalues, and also removing, of course, those near zero eigenvalues. So this is a uh, um, a solution built out of out of that. These are um, you know these this u um, matrix is uh, a bunch of eigenvectors that essentially interact against the uh, the data. All right, and uh, the v eigenvectors are eigenvectors in the model space. So um, you know we have eigenvectors in both uh, the data space and the model space. Um, <clears throat> and then the uh, the relative strengths of the different uh, eigenvalues for each of those eigenvectors tells us a lot about the uh, um, about the uh, the relative influence of those um, of those different eigenvectors. <clears throat> so um, it's very important uh, to look at the null space of uh, of V. This is the null space of the model. There's also uh, what you could call a null space of the of the data. Um, so these are um, um, <clears throat> the the null space of V, which is the whole V, uh, the uh, data. I'm sorry, the model space eigenvectors. Okay, so those are the types of models that uh, um, you know all the different model types or modes, if you will, minus the uh, the ones that are partitioned out. Okay. The, the, the ones that are partitioned out are the ones that are that correspond to non-singular uh, non-zero singular values. Okay, so v minus v sub p really is the null space of the model. Likewise, uh, you could construct uh, u minus u sub p, and that would be uh, I might call it the null space of the data. You know that would indicate uh, you know functions in the data that do not influence the model, just like the null space of the model are functionals in the across the model space that have no influence on the data. And so it's often good to uh, evaluate these. All right, uh, you can call you can call these eigenvalues uh, Green's functions if you like, um, and the null space of the model V um, indicates the. Uh, the delta s variations, the delta s maps, if you like, that you can't resolve by the data, uh, or in other words, the ray set. Okay, again, the data really are controlled by the ray set. So let's consider this simple problem. Maybe it's a map. All right, we've got uh, four blocks, and each of those blocks has a a slowness perturbation in our model space. There's delta s one, delta s two, delta s three, delta s four. You know, I've I've kind of arbitrarily numbered them, right? They're not numbered on any sort of uh, axis. They're just numbered. Um, and then I have some rays that cross these blocks. There's uh, observation one, which uh, um, leads to um, delay delta t one. There's delta t two, which which and you can see the ray crosses blocks two and three, delta t three, uh, and delta t four. All right. So this you know geophysically, this is a pretty good case. Uh, I, I mean, we have uh, all of our blocks have rays in them, um, and in fact, uh, all of our blocks are are connected to other blocks by uh, uh, by rays. Um, so uh, you know this is this ought to be a pretty good case. Okay, we only have four model parameters to find, and we do have four uh, pieces of data to use. So you know it's uh, the number of equations uh, matches the number of uh, unknowns, and that's uh, that's all good. Okay, so um, if I make a uh, L matrix, it's going to be the uh, for this uh, situation. You know, we can have ray number R and then uh, block number B. 
So uh, let's see. The way I've set up this matrix, that's the um, um, the blocks. You know, this this row, the first row, the row on the left is for block number one. The row on the the next row is for block number. I'm sorry. The column on the left is for block number one. The column next column is for block number two. Block number three in this column, and on the right column, block number four. Ray one is is row one. Ray two is row two, and so forth. Okay, so um, that's how. And and notice, you know, L gets uh, um, multiplied by the column vector, and so the column vector of blocks gets, um, um, which is four. You know, this is uh, it's just by chance here. It's four by four, right? Uh, but um, the Column vector of four blocks gets transposed and laid across across the first row, dot product with it, and that results in the uh, uh, in the first uh, delay delta t in the column vector that's uh, on the left. If you remember how that works. Okay, so um, uh, R the information matrix L transpose L is the number of blocks by the number of blocks. So that's also four by four. Okay. And so now we can examine each row of the information matrix. All right, and um, this row here is for uh, is for block one. That's for block two. That's for block three. That's for block four. Okay. So let's take uh, say um, row one for block one. Okay. So there's. Uh, uh, there's now our, our, our map, you know, in our in our ge geometric situation, you know, given the, the the blocks and how they're numbered. This is where the the blocks are located on the map, and so the information, the row of the information matrix for block one is telling us, all right, if we have a um, uh, if we have a slowness perturbation that's only in block one. And we do the the uh, the back projection, okay? It's going to look like this, okay? So here's the map of the first row of of the information matrix. They're the one that's for block number one, okay? It's the first row has two for block number one. Put that in there. Has one for block number two. Put that in there. Has zero for block number three. That goes in there. Has one for block number four. Put that in there, okay? So um, that's uh, uh, I think you could see why this is called the point spread function. Okay, you know if you have in in the real world, you know if you had data from a um, uh, and the only slowness perturbation was in block one, then you see the uh, uh, what you get out of the tomography is yeah it's it's certainly you know the the delta s uh, estimate uh, map is certainly concentrated at block number one, but it's also drawn out along the predominant ray directions. Okay, so it's a point spread function. We put a point in uh, in the, on the map, and this is the spread we get out. The blurring of the tomographic inver inversion. Okay, very naturally along the predominant ray directions. Let's look at putting a, a, a point at block two. Okay, so that's the second row of the of the R matrix. Block um, right. Block uh, uh, block one gets a one. Block two gets a two. Block uh, three gets a one. Block four gets a zero. All right. So again, you know the point. Is spread out along the predominant ray directions, and you see this, uh, you know, now prominently, you know, you see point spread functions, you know, as artifacts in all um, tomographic uh, results. Um, now, my advisor Clayton, um, you know, I walked into his office one day and he. He looked up from a piece of paper on his desk and he said, "I just, I just inverted by, I just did a singular value decomposition by hand of this, uh, of this L transpose L, right? Because the, 
This, the SVD depends entirely on the information matrix R. Okay, so just by knowing the rays, and the, you know that's all you need to uh, uh, to construct the uh, uh, the SVD. Okay, and so the um, you know he had uh, uh, found out that there is in fact one defective singular value, and it corresponds to this eigenvector here. Okay. So block one gets a plus one, block two gets a minus one, block three gets a plus one, and block four gets a minus one. Okay. So any any delta s variation, you know, of uh, a structural map of that type, you know, if it's uh, you know plus a hundred, minus a hundred, minus a hundred, plus a hundred, right? Any any um, scaled version of that configuration, that mode, if you want to call it that. Um, you can't constrain with that ray set. Okay. Um, does somebody want to suggest a ray that that would constrain this uh, defective singular value? Yeah. Even one of the diagonals could could constrain it. You know, at least partially. So then it wouldn't be a defective singular value. It might be a a very small. I mean, a very uh, large. Uh, very, it might be very near singular, okay. So dividing by it uh, might might not be a good idea, but uh, um, it's uh, um, it's uh, 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 still going to help. You know, wouldn't wouldn't be exactly defective anymore. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't have quite the uh, the brilliance that uh, Clayton does. Uh, most of my uh, fiddling on pieces of paper when I have to do it just involve uh, simple uh, geometry problems, uh, trigonom trigonometry problems. Um, so I uh, I had to uh, uh, you know work out a uh, an AVO um, uh, relationship, you know. Uh, Angle versus offset for uh, dipping uh, reflector, you know, and watching the the midpoint climb the reflect the reflector as offset increased, and um, you know, neither me nor uh, uh, any of my colleagues at uh, at Victoria uh, could find any any reference to it. You know, it's very simple geometry, but it took me uh, three pages of uh, of trigonometry to work out. Um, Probably just because I, I I wasn't doing it uh, you know efficiently. So John, that's kind of the, the guess and check way. But how do you compute these if you just if I gave you a forty by forty? And how do we pull out the null space? Um, you know, if you look at the, um, uh, I mean, um, uh, you can use uh, 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 MATLAB, right? And MATLAB would probably work on a forty by forty. So you just break it into all the different sub blocks, and then you get the eigenvectors. You just all you have to cope with is the L matrix, right? And then you you uh, you use MATLAB to figure uh, L transpose L, and then you shove it through uh, SVD uh, uh, routine. Um, now Christoph Stork did this for his uh, thesis, um, and uh, his model was uh, hundreds by hundreds. And he used a uh, he used a, a Linpack. Um, uh, uh, it was software uh, written by uh, <clears throat> computer scientists at uh, um, um, uh, I think Los Alamos National Lab. So um, he used that on a uh, on a Cray, which probably had a whopping you know hundred megs of RAM you know at the time. Uh, he used that in a Cray at Chevron and La Habra uh, to do his thesis. So he has a. Uh, I might show you some of some uh, some of these results, but they're very interesting. Uh, you know, to my to my mind, um, the um, the modes, uh, you know, like this, uh, um, you know, like this defective singular value, the eigenvectors themselves. They look uh, they look very much like Fourier modes, you know, two D Fourier modes. Um, 
uh, spherical harmonics, that sort of thing, drumhead modes. Um, so uh, uh, I think the uh, uh, and if you can if you can Fourier transform your uh, your your matrix in the right way, I think uh, that would be the the key to uh, uh, you know to getting the SVD because then you, you can solve it in the in the Fourier domain. Um, I'm not sure that's true, but um, the uh, uh, the eigenvectors look very much like Fourier modes, um, and uh, uh, I can uh, I can give you I can loan you uh, Chris Stork's thesis, and it's full of them, just absolutely full of uh, of Fourier modes. He he printed uh, he printed a lot of them out, um, and it's uh, it's pretty impressive. You know he printed out a lot. You know the ones that were best constrained. A few examples of the ones that were, you know, reasonably to poorly constrained, and then he printed out uh, a bunch of examples of ones that were uh, unconstrained. And uh, very interesting thesis that way. Um, I'm sure now you could do it on, on MATLAB on a laptop. <laughs> yeah. uh, and you know that might be worth doing um, for. Uh, um, you know, for any tomography problem, and of course, you know, you add more one more ray, the whole thing changes. You gotta you gotta redo it. Okay. <clears throat> so Humphreys and Clayton many years ago had the um, uh, had a good solution for the. Uh, um, for an iterative back projection solution, okay, uh, because at that time, you know, at least at uh, at Caltech, um, uh, I mean, we were we were starting to build parallel uh, parallel machines, but we had not figured out even how to um, run the uh, the FFT in parallel uh, efficiently, and um, uh, we were a long way from um, from from being able to do a singular value decomposition in in parallel. So we did not have the uh, the big cray. Um, you know, Kristoff uh, only got only got access to the cray when he was working at Chevron. So um, it was a uh, a very special deal. So we wanted to you know we wanted to do. Um, um, uh, these back projections on our on our uh, two megabyte RAM uh, VAX, our mainframe, um, and uh, so Humphreys and Clayton came up with this uh, this method, uh, which is you know as as Clairbout shows in uh, PVI, processing versus inversion, it's really a uh, uh, a very time honored method. All right. But they were the first, I, I believe, to uh, apply it to uh, seismic tomography. Uh, again, the objective here is to assess lateral velocity variation. Okay, um, and I would probably okay. So first of all, iterated tomography is still, at least for earthquake seismologists, it's it's the method. Okay, and so we've got to show you. Uh, it would be irresponsible of me to call this a, a class on tomography in any way, and not show you show this to you, even though, in my opinion, all of that is superseded by uh, Satish's optimizations and then the optimizations that have grown out of that. Okay, uh, because the earthquake seismologists and the mantle seismologists are doing this so successfully uh, with these exact methods, um, it's uh, it's really worth learning. In fact, the whole two hundred million dollar Earthscope program is really, uh, despite all the other things that they talked about to fund it, um, it was really to run iterated back projection tomography on delays from the mantle, uh, uh, the upper mantle specifically. So that was the whole Earthscope program, two hundred million dollar uh, federal project, which is uh, uh, almost complete now. It's uh, quite amazing. Um, 
So let's, uh, let's derive the back projection solution by applying Jacobi iteration to the normal equations. Um, we have already made the assumptions necessary to linearize the equations. So you know, think back to uh, the linearization. Um, um, we, um, we, uh, uh, so we don't, we haven't said yet, are we changing the rays between iterations? We might or we might not. Okay, um, you know we might just have uh, rays traced through our reference model and that's it. Okay, and that's still, you know, it still may or may not be necessary for any particular seismological tomography. Um, and you have to, you know, that's one of the first things that I read a tomography paper to figure out. You know, what's the degree of velocity variation they have? How linear is the system? And and uh, uh, should they be uh, uh, re-ray re tracing um, and and going beyond the, the linearized? Okay, so we need the linearization uh, assumptions. Basically, that the slowness perturbations are much much less than the slowness. I say no more than five percent, uh, and that the delays are much much less than the um, um, than the total travel times. Again, uh, less than five percent. Okay, um, so we have um, uh, this. Uh, you know, the normal equation is written like this: L transpose L times the uh, slowness perturbation column vector is equal to L transpose times the uh, uh, the data column vector, the delay column vector. And let's uh, let's rewrite it. Okay, we're going to use the tomographic approximation. Okay, which uh, involves the diagonal of L transpose L. Okay, so let's uh, put a uh, uh, let's put a uh, 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 an let's make an object a matrix D, which is uh, a diagonal matrix that where the diagonal is equal to the diagonal elements of L transpose L. Okay, we're just pulling that out of a hat. I mean, we've got L transpose L, so we can find its diagonals, all right, and construct this matrix D. So then, if you take uh, D minus L transpose L, you get the negative of the off diagonal elements, and um, uh, yeah, that's right. And uh, and then you 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 um, uh, basically here we're we're adding zero, right? We're adding. Uh, uh, we're, we're changing L transpose L delta S into D minus the quantity D minus L transpose L, uh, and then uh, that uh, whole um, uh, difference applied to uh, delta S. Okay, and then over here on the right we still have L transpose applied to delta T. All right, so let's uh, let's now distribute delta S into here. Uh, and we're going to write this as an iterative procedure. Okay, so uh, distributing uh, delta s, I'll do it like this. <clears throat> we have uh, uh, d uh, uh, applied to delta s minus the quantity d minus l transpose l, which is the off diagonal elements applied to uh, delta s. Okay, equals still on the right hand side L transpose uh, uh, delta T. Notice that we're we're always pre multiplying. We're not assuming commutivity, which in, in general is not true for matrix multiplication. So we're uh, we're making sure to honor that. Um, and um, uh, then we have. Uh, 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 we'll just uh, uh, slightly rearrange this. That we have um, uh, d um, uh, d delta s at iteration k is equal to L transpose delta t, and you should recognize this as the back projection, right? This is the next uh, iteration, right? Delta s is the next model. Delta S K is the next model, okay. Plus what? Uh, what's the correction to the back projection to get the next model? It's D minus 
uh, L transpose L all applied to delta S at the previous iteration. All right, moving that to the other side. Okay, adding it to both sides. Um, and now we're going to identify. This is the uh, on the left here. We have the estimate <clears throat> for the next iteration, and on the right here is the uh, the previous model from the previous iteration, k minus one. So now um, we have uh, we have constructed d such that we can invert it. Okay, um, and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, inherent in here uh, and unstated is the partitioning, because there's always blocks that uh, you know have uh, no rays in them, and we're just partitioning those away. We're we're going to ignore them. Okay, so really it's a partition D, and everything else is partitioned too. Um, but uh, this is the uh, this is the part that we're partitioning in. Okay, so. Um, we uh, we invert. Of course, you have a non-singular um, diagonal matrix. It's very easy to invert it. So we we pre-multiply uh, everything uh, on the uh, every term by d inverse. D inverse times d, of course, is just identity. So we drop the identity, and so we have here our solution for the next model, delta s at iteration k. Okay. Um, we have d inverse times L transpose delta t. That you should recognize as the back projection. Okay, so d inverse is uh, uh, is basically that original back projection summation solution. Um, you know the denominator, and then here's the numerator uh, summation um, in that original uh, back projection uh, summation uh, uh, quotient. <clears throat> now, what uh, and I had to I had to correct this. All right, um, what you get here by pre-multiplying by d is uh, you get i minus um, d inverse applied to L transpose L. Okay, applied to um, uh, the previous iteration. All right. Uh, now let's figure out. Uh, uh, you know the tomographic approximation says that um, that this uh, this here, um, which is d minus l transpose l, is uh, is zero. Those those off diagonal elements. The tomographic approximation says those are zero. Okay. Um, so according to the tomographic approximation, you know the back projection here would be the whole solution. The whole thing. All right. So this is the uh, correction. What are we what are we doing here? <clears throat> okay. So um, uh, you know this is mostly uh, um, uh, so this is the uh, let's see uh, we have here um, the previous iteration right and so. We're applying identity to the previous iteration, and we're adding it to the back projection. Okay, so a lot of uh, you know a lot of what's there is um, uh, a lot of what's there is um, um, is just uh, you know a lot of the new model is the old model. Okay, <clears throat> and then um, and then what are we doing here? Okay. We've got the slowness, uh, the previous uh, model space, delta s at k iteration k minus one, the previous iteration, all right, and we take l l applied to delta s. What does that get us? That get us, gets us um, synthetic travel times through that model. Okay, we take a model in the model space, we we multi, we pre multiply it by l, we get synthetic travel times. Okay. And then those synthetic travel times are operated on by L transpose. So what's that? That's the back projection of the synthetic travel times. Okay, and then we uh, uh, we multiply that by d inverse. So so uh, uh, you know that's the scaled back projection of the 
uh, synthetic travel times. Okay, so uh, we're essentially correcting the model by the uh, um, by the uh, um, we're correcting the model by the um, uh, by the scaled um, no by the back projection of the uh, of the errors. Okay. From the previous model. Are you really still just using the diagonals? In in D, L transpose L is the whole thing. Because L transpose would be equal to L. So for instance, that first term, the back projection would just be the identity matrix. No, no, no. L transpose is uh, is the uh, is the transpose. It's not it's not equal to L. But of a diagonal matrix. No, 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 no. Um, the place where we insert the the diagonal assumption um, of L transpose L is D. So L transpose L is still the full information okay. matrix. Right. Yeah, so then there's you know, so there's uh, uh, there's uh, uh, you know there's the full L just L transpose there, and there's uh, there's D which is just the diagonals. <clears throat> yeah, so, so we're doing the same thing there. I got confused when you said D minus L transpose L was zero. That's where you kind of lost. Uh, but I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not being assumed here, right? Because we're le if, if D minus L transpose L was zero, then this whole term would go, go zero. So the tomographic approximation says we only need this first term. We only need the back projection. That's right. That's right. So let's uh, you know start the iteration. We have a reference model, right? So our we'll start with the zeroth order um, slowness perturbation model, uh, delta s at zero equal to zero everywhere. Okay, and so that means that uh, the first model is just the back projection, right? If uh, delta s is zero, then this whole term is zero, and so you know delta s at iteration one is the back projection. Okay, so again, you know, as I'm going to keep emphasizing again and again, the uh, the back projection, the adjoint, right? Modeling is L applied to delta s. The adjoint operation, the uh, is L transpose uh, delta t. And that's really most of the work, okay. And so here's that that back projection solu summation solution again, right? Where we're, um, you know, we're taking the 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 this is uh, L transpose applied to T. That's really doing most of the work on the on the numerator there, the numerator summation. The denominator summation is doing some scaling by total ray lengths. Um, you know, total uh, total ray length squared. Um, a principal advantage of back projection methods is that they process the observations sequentially. You don't have to have storage proportional to the size of the observation data set. You know, in most seismological problems, in, and in most um, exploration problems. You know, we have using multi-offset data. You know, we've got lots more observations, lots more delays in our in our data set than we have cells in our model space. Now, in you know, in, in high resolution exploration, we we're going to start bumping up against you know large, large, very large numbers of uh, of uh, uh, cells in the model space, but we. Um, uh, we're also um, in those cases with multi-offset data sets. You know, we're still going to maintain even e an even larger number of observations. So uh, this was very appealing uh, back in the day. Um, um, 
in this uh, prehistoric era, before you could carry your uh, your computer around the uh, around the landscape, um, and um, the uh, um, because and 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 it appealed to seismologists too, and and really it's the foundation of the Earthscope um, project, the Earthscope Observatory is that you know whenever there's a new observation there's a new delay and you you redo the back projection okay so you you um, process the delays uh, sequentially uh, process the data sequentially and that means you only have to maintain you know storage proportional to the the size of the uh, of the model space and uh, most of the seismological problems were set up <clears throat> so that that would, would fit into the computer of the day. <clears throat> um, so here's a, uh, you know, here's a, an update, right? Um, so uh, uh, you... Uh, um, Uh, you know, it's it's about the uh, uh, if you want, it's about the uh, difference between the uh, um, the synthetic uh, um, right. You can generate synthetic times, okay, and um, for a previous model, and you can uh, subtract them from the observed times, which is just I'll just call delta t here. And then you do a you know a d inverse L transpose applied to that gives you a slowness perturbation, and you add that to the you add the the um, you know that model that you derive from the time errors, okay, to the previous model, and that's your new model. And you can see that's really the same equation as this here. Um, Boxed in blue. So um, you know, further iteration will will yield some solution um, as a uh, least squares uh, uh, inversion. Okay, and this you know this has been shown to work you know by math by applied mathematicians for uh, for any uh, linearized problem. Okay, so. You know, if if the problem is really not that linear, then we can run into trouble, um, and uh, we're going to explore in a bit. Not not yet, but in a bit, we're going to explore a lot more about you know how fast convergence is and how you get convergence faster and all of that. Okay. Um, you know, essentially the updates have to be small to guarantee convergence. If if the uh, if the synthetic um, Delta T's are are if the synthetic delays are about the same size as the uh, data delays, then you got trouble. You're you're going to have to go nonlinear. All right. Um, as iteration, right, you can approach the nonlinear problem uh, where the rays move in response to inverted delta S distributions, uh, and we're going to talk more about you know this sort of nonlinear inversion. And what what that can do? Okay, uh, it is of course fraught with uh, uh, with traps and uh, and all that. Um, but uh, uh, you can try it. You know, at least this gives you a very efficient way to try it. Okay, so you know you might uh, you might poo poo the uh, the simplifications that we make. Um, you know, you might diss them as as being too simple, and you know, we yeah, maybe we did only do it 25 years ago because our computers were so lame at the time. Um, but uh, they also give you a tremendous ability to explore. You know, now that you have tremendous computer power, um, you know, on your back if not in your hand. Um, you can you can really do some amazing things. You can do some amazing trials that we couldn't dream of, you know, taking our methods to their limits and finding out where they break. So this, uh, you know, new ray tracing for every iteration, 
that's, uh, that's one of those opportunities, you know, redefining the L matrix at each iteration. OK. Uh, let me give a very short introduction to number uh, 13. Um, which I'll go through uh, tomorrow on Wednesday at 9. Um, so, uh, uh, and then I'll move on to, um, uh, to number 14 tomorrow. Don't think this will take the whole, uh, the whole time. Um, OK, so uh, what I'd like to do is present to you uh, Gene Humphreys' uh, original thesis work, and, um, and this is out of his paper, I believe. Um, two, three. That's probably uh, this is probably directly out of his thesis. Okay. Um, he was privileged to have uh, what turned out to be a uh, kind of a preview of what the Earthscope Observatory would uh, could do for us in the upper mantle. He had the Southern California network. So you can see it's a kind of blobby, elongated blobby. Uh, distribution of stations. There are uh, quite a few stations, um, and they, uh, uh, you know, you could see it's a uh, at its at the time, uh, and it still is um, one of the most complete regional arrays. Okay, so the stations are are fairly close together. They have fairly wide distribution over a few hundred kilometers especially east-west. Not too bad a distribution north-south. All right. Uh, they include stations up in the, uh, the UNR area as well, um, many of which they still operate. They've extended the network now. Uh, they've filled in a lot of these holes um, you know, along the San Jacinto Fault here. Uh, in the Death Valley area here, they filled a lot of holes. They, uh, we have a lot of stations in these areas now, so uh, you can combine uh, uh, the uh, the arrays in southern Nevada and uh, uh, in um, uh, in Southern California into a pretty good array. Um, there's a uh, um, a Gutenberg Byerly line um, between um, uh, Berkeley stations and um, um, and uh, um, and Caltech stations. That line's only been breached in the last, uh, say, uh, five or ten years. Have uh, <laughs> people actually been been uh, using the combined data sets uh, to do uh, tomography up and down California? Um, the uh, uh, you know the development of the Southern California Earthquake Center SCEC, that really perpetuated the uh, um, the uh, the Gutenberg Byerly uh, line because uh, SCEC uh, would not pay for anyone to do any analysis outside of Southern California, um, so that unfortunately uh, remained. Um, so today uh, on the Cal on the California Nevada border, we still have a, uh, a SCEC boundary. And um, uh, anyone who uses SCEC money to, uh, uh, to look at uh, phenomena or tomography in Nevada is uh, risking their project. Um, so, uh, uh, in a way, um, you know, this network as it was 30 years ago is. Um, uh, not, but not that much better now, okay. Um, and there was a uh, uh, a PhD student, uh, and and you know I've forgotten her name, but um, uh, she noticed a certain uh, uh, phenomenon, which I'll show you in a bit. Uh, but first, let's let's continue and and look at this uh, data set. This is actually. 
um, this uh, student's data set, but it was uh, you know, further analyzed in this innovative way by Gene Humphreys. So in a sense, he got all the credit. <clears throat> um, this is a polar map centered on Southern California, probably centered on, uh, on Caltech, which um, shows the locations of all the events in this data set. And you can see there's one lonely event that's really close to the antipode. You know, 180 degrees is on this outer circle. It's in the, uh, the middle of the Indian Ocean. So um, um, uh, there aren't very many uh, earth. There aren't very many uh, waves coming all the way through the inner core and the core. Uh, but there's a lot of events that are angling up through the Southern California mantle. Um, you know, from these sort of uh, intermediate distances. And they're from a, uh, a few different azimuths. You know, they're coming from the uh, South American subduction zone. They're coming from Japan and the Aleutians. Uh, and they're coming from the Tonga Kermadec uh, um, subduction zone. Um, and then, so these are uh, uh, ray parameter azimuth. Uh, uh, plots, you know, of of the rays coming into Southern California. Um, let's see. The uh, inner circle is uh, five seconds per degree. That's uh, you know degree of longitude and um, sorry degree of latitude. And this is uh, um, ten seconds per per degree. So. Um, you know, fairly, uh, um, mostly fairly high apparent velocities, fairly large p. So coming, coming not straight up, but uh, but coming at a uh, a pretty good angle, uh, uh, a near vertical angle. So, um, and I don't know whether uh, Humphreys repicked the uh, the arrivals or not. Um, I believe these are p arrivals. Yeah. There, uh, there's almost 10,000 travel time residuals, okay, and um, uh, you know each ray has one uh, one residual to all these. Uh, uh, what does it look like? There's at least 100 stations in um, in Southern California here, and uh, so every earthquake uh, you know could be picked on uh, you know not quite 100 stations, but close. So there's uh, many hundreds of uh, uh, many thousands. Uh, well, there's ten thousand uh, observations. Okay, ten thousand uh, delays. And so the reference model used was the uh, the popular uh, you know radially symmetric, actually uh, ellip ellipsoidally symmetric uh, reference model at the time. Okay, and so looking at the arrival time versus uh, the uh, and subtracting the reference time, you know, given the known location and time of the earthquake, that uh, that gives you the delay. Okay, positive delay is uh, is late. Okay, so you know most most of the uh, arrivals are late. You can see the actual peak is just slightly late. Um, you know, about 0.1 second. Um, almost all the delays are are less than one second. Okay. But they're, and this is important, you know, they're um, basically, not quite, but basically centered around, around zero. What this, uh, what this says is that on average, the Southern California mantle is slower and delays earthquakes uh, than the average Earth mantle. Okay. Um, and in fact, uh, 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 another um, um, another PhD grad, uh, Marianne Walk, uh, who's now at um, Sandia, I think. Yeah, she's at Sandia. Um, uh, her thesis was was on the uh, what's called the tectonic Southern California upper mantle, you know, which is just a bit slow. Okay, here's the observation. 
Uh, and the, and Jean's figure caption does not credit the original thesis. Um, so maybe he had repicked all these, but uh, he noticed the uh, same phenomenon that this pr prior student did. So we have um, uh, for a uh, uh, this is uh, uh, delta here. That's the uh, distance in degrees of the of the earthquake. So 180 degrees is as far as you can get, right? The others, that's uh, the antipode. This is the uh, uh, I think the one that's almost at the antipode, 175 degree delta. So the rays are pretty much coming up, coming coming straight up. Okay, the dark triangles are um, negative delays. Let's see. Yeah, uh, they're early arrivals, and the the uh, open squares are late arrivals. So you know you can see uh, across uh, the transverse ranges of Southern California and extending out to the Channel Islands. Coming straight up, you've got these uh, these uh, early arrivals, these negative delays that come from, you know, some uh, uh, some high slowness. I'm sorry, uh, some negative slowness perturbation, which would be a high velocity. Okay, and then um, you um, if you shift. Um, and uh, uh, the delta is uh, coming from Japan, only 82 degrees away. So really, the, the rays are coming, uh, you know, down the coast of California, um, you know, in the direction of the San Andreas, actually. And what's what was amazing in that data set was how this this early shadow shifts to the southeast. Okay. So we're looking at an object that's down in the mantle that's fast and producing these negative delays. It also starts to pick up this uh, so-called Isabella anomaly, uh, which wasn't figured out until uh, about uh, 15 years later. Uh, that's the uh, fast uh, eclogite peeling off the bottom of the, uh, um, of, the, of the crust that's been deeply buried underneath the the Sierra Nevada mountains. Okay, so uh, uh, you know this thesis didn't constrain the uh, the Isabella anomaly, but finally we we do have a, an explanation. Um, yeah, so that's the fundamental observation. Okay, uh, you could see it, you know, just by mapping out the delays. And um, so now let's uh, uh, here's uh, the reference model. Uh, it's called Prem, um, and it's uh, it's a slow uh, reference model. It's adjusted to be uh, to be the Gulf of California tectonic North America model of Marianne Walk. Um, so let's uh, let's see now what we can do with this uh, with this delay set. So that'll be uh, rest. Of that'll be tomorrow.